We've had kind of a journey with carbon dioxide on this channel. CO2 is a marker, is what we've come to now. It's not dangerous by itself, but it's a marker for other things that might be happening. And what I'm about to show you is a video from someone else. This is a researcher out of the UK whose name is Al Hadrell. I'm gonna do an interview with him as well to follow this up, I hope. He has an interesting way of tracking CO2 to essentially simulate a blower door. This is called a tracer gas test, what is he's actually classically running. And um, it's actually better than a blower door test. A blower door test is one point in time, even though we love it, uh, it's it, we kind of make a lot of assumptions out of that. So this is measuring actual air replacements uh, within a home and also based on ventilation if you've got a system like that. So I'd like to just, I'm gonna run this video and I will pause it and interject at certain points, but I think that this is important for you guys to see. So a useful way to limit your exposure to airborne pathogens, so things like SARS-CoV-2 and influenza, is to physically remove the aerosol that carries these pathogens from the room. Uh, there are a couple ways you can do this. Uh, one way is through filtration. So this is an engineering solution. And another way is through ventilation. So doing things like opening your window. So having a more ventilated or better ventilated space is good. So the question then becomes like, how do you know if this room is well ventilated? Uh, what can I do to make the ventilation better? Is there anything I can do to make the ventilation worse? Uh, so in this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain how you can use CO2 monitors, just like this type, to measure how well your rooms are being ventilated. Let me just pause for a second and just remind everybody that filtration is a much less expensive and uh, can be a more effective way to clean the air because you can get a lot more airflow, a lot more stuff captured by a filter. With ventilation from outside dilution air, it's very expensive because we have to heat or cool that air. We have to dehumidify or humidify that air potentially. We have to filter that air as well on top of it. And so just FYI, make sure that you're hitting filtration first. And then of course you can't avoid needing dilution air, but the amount of air that we're talking about is much smaller. Ventilation is described mathematically as the air changes per hour, or ACH for short. The ACH describes the rate in which the air in the room has been removed and replaced with clean air. In this equation, Q is the amount of air that is flowing through the room over a period of time. This will have units like cubic feet per minute. Vol is the volume of the room, which will be units like cubic feet. Now, you would think that of an ACH of 1 would mean that 100% of the air in the room would be replaced every hour. If the room was a pipe, this would be true. Every cubic foot of room air would be replaced by one cubic foot of fresh air added. However, for a room, this is just not the case. This is because the fresh air that's added to the room is mixed with the air already in the room, and thus only a fraction of the air is removed. As a result, an ACH of 1 actually means only about 63% of the air is removed per hour. Okay, this is really interesting. I'm, gonna, I'm actually starting to incorporate this number into my consultations with people. And what we basically have going on is you take the volume of any room, you divide by 60. And it gives you the CFM rating for one air change per hour. So, for example, a let's say a 10 by 10 room is 100 square feet. Let's say it's got a nine foot ceiling. That's 900 cubic feet of air. You divide 900 cubic feet by 60 and it gives you 15. So if we had a 15 CFM exhaust or supply in that room or both, we would be taking one air change per hour based on the basic math. But Alan's uh, addition here of 63% means we divide by 0.63 on this number and it actually now becomes the number is 24 roughly cfm so it would really take 24 cfm to give one air change per hour and if you happen to have an erv exhaust for example in that room that is running 25 cfm then you're getting about one air change per hour and that might be enough for you you might want more you might want less so that that bit of uh, math i really like all right, so in terms of airborne disease transmission, what really matters is the time it takes for a significant proportion of the air to be physically replaced by fresh air. The relationship between ACH and the time taken to replace 99% of the air in the room is shown here. You'll note that the relationship is not linear. For example, an ACH of 1 takes 276 minutes to replace 99% of the air. 
By increasing the ACH to 4, the time taken to replace 99% of the air drops to 69 minutes. This is a dramatic drop in time, demonstrating the importance of increasing the ventilation in poorly ventilated spaces. Increasing the ACH from 4 to 10 drops this time even further, down to 28 minutes. This more than doubling of the ACH leads to about a halving of the time taken to replace the air. If the ACH is increased from 10 all the way to 50, the time will drop, but not as dramatically. This means that after a certain point, the payoff from increasing the ACH is just not as significant. Now, regardless, the higher the ACH, the better. Anything that you do to increase the ACH will help lower the amount of infectious virus-containing aerosol that is in the air, and thus will lower the risk of transmission. Now, just to clarify, again, filtration can give you this ACH. Air changes per hour is both used in HVAC to talk about air cycles per hour, and also in enclosure testing when we talk about blower door, which is the amount of times the air is replaced completely by outside air. That's ACH 50, for example, when we talk about that. So the air, the clean air delivery rate, CADR, that you'll see on some uh, filtration units or air cleaners, that is a measure of this. Even if it's not taking the air from outside and injecting it into the room, it's the amount of times that the air cycles basically within the room. So you can get this air changes per hour again with the filtration, but I, I really like his point that again, this mixing of the clean air, whether it's clean filtered air or clean outdoor air, clean outdoor air, coming into the room is then mixing. And the faster you do that, the more effective you're gonna get at that 99% replacement. All right, so how do you measure the ACH? Well, first thing you do is you go out and buy yourself a CO2 monitor. Um, this type is particularly popular, but really any, any type can do. The type that he's got in his hand is called the Aeronet 4. It's about $200, and it is by the chemists that we work with. They swear that this thing is one of the best things under $1,000 to measure this. And when he says any type will work, uh, I, I would add a caveat. This uses what's called an NDIR sensor, which is very accurate for CO2. A lot of the consumer grade ones, they're going to measure CO2 and TVOC and PM2.5 and temperature and humidity and look pretty. And they're like $150. They're not using that sensor. So that's one thing that I just like to add. All that you're really looking for when you're purchasing your CO2 monitor is one that records the CO2 values when you're not around. To measure the ACH, first you need to measure the outdoor CO2. You do this by simply putting your CO2 monitor outside. In cities, the outdoor CO2 concentration can get higher than the commonly reported 420 parts per billion. For example, in my back garden in Bristol, it looks like the CO2 concentration is about 578. Next, simply put the CO2 monitor in the room that you're interested in. Then you need to increase the CO2 concentration. You can do this any way you like, from exercising to breathing to turn on the boiler. And finally, leave the room. Ideally, leave the building entirely. Make a note of anything that you think will affect the ventilation. For example, are any windows or doors open? That kind of thing. Also, you've turned off the stove, just to clear. He, he meant that, but he didn't say it. After at least an hour, come back and look at the data. From the data, the numbers you want to write down are as follows. The outdoor CO2 concentration. The concentration when you left the room. The CO2 concentration when the loss is a little over halfway between the outdoor CO2 and the CO2 when you left the room. And finally, the length of time between these two points. Now, put these numbers into this equation and solve for the ACH. This is where you put those numbers. And I'll show you how to calculate that, calculate that using my calculator. First, you'll need to set your calculator to scientific. All right, so for my data, I calculate an ACH of 0 0.52 for my kitchen. Okay, so <laughs> my ACH in my kitchen is 0 0.52, which isn't particularly high, but it's actually pretty common for old, older homes. Uh, for context, I live in a 160-year-old house in England, so ACH of, a point, of 0 0.52 is about par for the course. Um, the question then becomes, is there anything I can do to increase the ventilation rate in my home? And is there any sort of combination of windows being opened 
that will maximize the ventilation rate of my home. So this is the floor plan of my home. And this is where the CO2 monitor was placed during my experiment. When everything was closed, the ACH was 0.52. So what happens when I say open my kitchen window? Well, when I do that, I get numbers that look like this. And when I put them into the calculator, I get an ACH of 1.3, or 1.43, sorry. That is a little better, but still under the recommended value of 4. Now, when I open both the window in the front of my house and the kitchen window, things get even better, where the ACH increases all the way up to 4.8. You can see how simple changes like this, like the combination of windows to open, will maximize your ACH. For example, here we see that opening the windows across the house likely creates an effective draft through the house, which again increases the ventilation. Every house is different. Also, the furnishing of every home is different. For example, something may obstruct the draft. How the wind blows onto every house is also different, and this too will affect the ventilation rate. What this all means is that for you to understand your home and what works best for your home, you'll need to check. And to figure that out, you'll need to do the kinds of experiments I've shown here. Now, some things to consider when interpreting your data. Like all science, repetition is important. The more times you repeat a measurement, the more confidence you will have in it. Second, the air exchange may not be coming solely from outside, meaning that if the next room over has a high CO2 level, the decay rate you're measuring may, may well be affected. Thus, to get a better understanding of how your home is ventilated, you ought to do this experiment throughout your home. And over time, you can build a picture of how your home is ventilated and where the air flows and how fast. Now, before we move on, just to review, we've taken an air changes per hour of once every two hours, which is 0.52. So every two hours, all the air in this kitchen, for example, is changed. That's very nice. Um, when we use an ERV in an airtight home, we're aiming for roughly once every three to six hours complete changes. So this means with one every two hours, with everything closed up, that kitchen is getting 12 full air changes per day, every day. And not when I say every day, I'm kind of defeating the whole purpose of what he, Alan is doing here, which is testing the actual on this day, because it's going to change. The other thing that's going to change about this, aside from the layout and the wind, is the weather. So every single day in this kitchen, it's going to be slightly different. If he's testing on like a average temperature day uh, in spring or fall, then he knows that in those conditions, it's going to be about 0.52. Um, but... Be very careful because taking it up to one and a half air changes per hour or even five air changes per hour, which is what he's doing when he's opening the front and the rear windows, that means you're going to get over a 24-hour period. If everything stays the same wind and weather-wise, you're looking at uh, you know over 100 air changes in your house per day. And one thing that that'll do is freak out your temperature in the house if the temperature inside is not the same as outside. The other thing is that it'll freak out the humidity in your house because rarely is that going to be the same, uh, especially in England where he's uh, living right now. And I'd say that uh, just to remind you, humidity is going to not just be in the air, but it soaks into stuff, solid things in your house, mostly soft things. And then those things become a battery. This is the exact same thing that happens with pollution. So if you live in an urban area where, for example, the CO2 level baseline outside is 578, you can be sure that there's also ozone in the air generally. Um, and so if you're going to be opening the doors all day when you've got traffic outside, you're going to get ozone in the house. That is going to be uh, reacting with things in your home and creating new chemicals that are then going to be spiking into those materials, just like the humidity does, and then coming back out slowly over time. So you can kind of take a big bunch of pollution all at once in a spike and then parse it out to your family over time. The other thing is that uh, if you're opening these windows at night, which a lot of people are like, oh, hey, I'm going to do this with like a whole house fan would. Overnight, I'll do this. Uh, at night, there is another chemical, which we uh, kind of jokingly called the vampire of reactive chemicals, and that's NOx, NO3, only exists at night. As soon as the sun comes out, it burns it off. So there are different pollutants that might be able to come in. And so getting to 5 ACH, uh, Alan's running an experiment here, and he's trying to prove a point and tell a story. And I think that that's awesome. But just for normal people, be cautious about this, because the more you increase that air change rate without door dilution air, not with filtration, 
the more you're potentially making your home susceptible to humidity spikes and um, pollution. So with just a simple to use device and time, you have a, the ability to understand how well infectious aerosol is being removed from your home and the kind of things that you can do to increase the rate in which infectious aerosol is being removed from your home. Um, I would encourage you to try this out because it allows you to understand, well, at least better understand how your house works and the kind of things that you can do to increase the indoor air quality in your home. And plus, science is fun. <laughs> All right, um, so if you like this video, please like. If you found it interesting and would like to see more, please subscribe. If you have any questions, put them in the comments below or ask me on Blue Sky or Twitter. And yeah, with that, Mix has all the references that I use to produce this video. So thanks, take it easy. So definitely do subscribe to Al Hadrell's channel on YouTube. I'm linking it in the description below. Like, subscribe, tune in next time.